This sermon series next is different. I want to reflect for a while on why do we do that? Now, before you see rituals in the church and go, ritual, that's a bad word. We're, we're going to stay away from rituals because Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. We're not about rituals. I, I know the bumper stickers and the taglines, but that's just, that's false. A ritual is just used in scholarship to mean a solemn ceremony that is performed with the same pattern over and over. We do a pattern over and over because it's important to us. You have rituals at home. You have rituals around Christmas, I'm sure. Yeah, every Christmas Eve we do blank. Well, they're rituals. No one goes, those are bad to have. Rituals are not inherently bad. If you have the ritual of murder, that's bad. The ritual doesn't make it bad. It's what you do that makes it bad, right? That's the ritual. But in religion, sir, or in religion sir, Islam, Christianity, whatever, all religions have rituals. Christians have them too. We have rituals in this church service. We have rituals we'll talk about today. We sing songs. We have the ritual of communion. We have the ritual of sermon. We have the ritual of prayer. We have many rituals in the church, and it's worth looking at all the time. If you're a new Christian, a lot of times I've experienced in my life, people go through years having no idea why we do what we do. Something as simple as, I was so glad Bennett said this, because we you know, talked in the week, and he, of course, you're right. He was saying, this is why we're doing these songs. They're songs we're repeating on purpose. If you don't know them, go to Spotify. It's all on purpose. Well, that's a ritual. That's on purpose, and it is on purpose, and it's a good purpose. Well, same thing in church. If you're new sometimes, you can go years never realizing, why do they do that? If you've been a Christian for a long time, I think it's always good to go back to basics and go, why am I doing this? So why do we do that? Why do we do that? Well, the first one I want to reflect on is, why do Christians meet? Why in the world do they get together and meet? Why get dressed up in sub-zero weather and come to a different location or online for all the other Christians? I'm kidding, you're Christian. I don't, I already got, I've gotten texts this morning, and brother, I can't make it because of weather. No, God bless you, seriously. But why do Christians meet? Why even tune in online to do that? Why do that? Why do Christians do that? Well, they've you know, done polls through the years of why Christians decide why they get together. Why even meet in the first place? What makes you go to a church in the first place? And this is a study in 2017. Here are the top answers for our several thousand people were interviewed. To become closer to God was the top answer. I'm not sure what that means exactly, to become closer to God, but we'll assume that's a good thing, okay? To come closer to God, 81%. So children have a moral foundation, that's really popular. That's especially popular for all the people who grow, grew up in church. They go off and live like pagans, non-Jews, non-Christians, and they come back and they grow up and then they have babies, and then they go, well, got to find a church. Why is that? I, want my, I grew up in church, and I want my kids to grow up with morals. I've heard that one all my church life. That's a very common one. And of course, nothing I just said there is why you go to church. But it's one of the number one reasons why people do go. Uh, I want a moral foundation. To make me a better person. Make me a better person. That's, that's a good thing. But eh, mm. uh, For comfort in times of trouble or sorrow, 66%. I find the sermons valuable. Eh, 59%. Eh, maybe. To be part of a community of faith. I found that to be a really popular one for people. Is that I go for community. A community, community, community. Uh, to continue a family's religious traditions. It's just what they do. My grandmom always went, so I got to go too. I've heard that one a lot. I feel religious obligation to go. Now, frankly, I think that's a good thing. I think we have the moral responsibility to, to go, but I'll talk about that in the sermon. Uh, people often hear that and go, oh, no, 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 you just go freely. What is freely? We're not in prison, but I think we do have the moral obligation to go. To meet new people, socialize, you know, hook up, find a spouse. A lot of people go to church for that. I lived in Houston for a while, and uh, there are a couple, well, there are almost every church, not really, is a mega church. There's many, many big, big churches. One church, particularly in town, was known as the Singles Church, and they had ha many hundred singles, and many marriages came out of that singles ministry, uh, really. To please my family, spouse, or partner, that's a big one, too. Why are you here? Because I was dragged in. Now, if you might say obligation, some people do it because they feel guilty, like, I've got to come. I feel guilty. If that's the case, that's unfortunate. But I'm curious, why do you come? If you think about these reasons, why do you come to, to church? Now, you might say, David, church isn't a building, it's a people. That's right. We'll talk about that. I get it. Ec church means a group of people. But about by the third and fourth century, it did get associated with a location. So there's nothing wrong with saying, I go to that church over there and the people inside it are the church. Okay, I, so it's both and in the Greek. If you disagree, that's fine. We can talk out of the search. Send your email to the deacons. Um, but why do you come here? Why do you come here? Why go to any church? Think about that for a second. Because the odds are you found yourself in some of these answers. 
I come because my parents made me. Now I feel guilty if I don't go. Uh, I come because I love, I have a couple friends there. I have community. I come because my spouse really wants me to, but I don't want to. I come because I'm barely hanging on. I mean, you know, I don't know. I come because the music. What I found in my experiences through all my ministry work is that I guarantee you, one, in my experience, and my experience is not all there is, but in my experience, 21 years of ministry, 100% of the reasons why people are dissatisfied with church, 100% of the complaints come when they don't have their expectations met. 100% of the time. So they show up and they're mad about the color of this, the sermon length, the sermon, the music loudness, whatever it might be, because they came expecting to get blank and they didn't get it. And so they start complaining about it. They came to meet to get that thing or those things. And when it didn't go their way, they get mad. So why they came might have been good reason they didn't get it. And that's why they're dissatisfied. I'm not saying the dissatisfaction is always inappropriate. I'm saying, but I guarantee you 100% of the time, in my experience, it's because they had expectations. What I've also found to be the case that most people don't know why they really come to church. Why do you do it? I want you to reflect on that. I hope even for the few, few hours we have together in the morning in the sermon. I'm kidding, Ken. And I want you to reflect on that this morning. I want God to search. Now, in the ancient world, I want to spend a, just a few minutes, okay? I really, just a few minutes time traveling. Now, why do this? David will sound like a lecture. It's okay for a few minutes, I think, because... We are spiritual heirs. If you're a Christian, some of you are not, okay, and online too. But if you're a disciple of Jesus and you time traveled almost 2,000 years ago and asked the question, why did the earliest Christians meet? Why did they do it? Because they did. Most people never reflected on why they got together. Now, the first thing, before starting with the church, you have to start with the Greco-Roman world because the church was not born in a vacuum. Why do they do that? Now, I'll go this pretty quickly. It's wordy. But in the first century, it was very common by then in Greek and Roman, so in Greek cities and in Roman city-states, to have free associations, pagan clubs, volunteer, like the Rotary Club, right? It's not prison. You don't find, a, you know, I, I know, Rotary Club. They had all kinds of, not, Rotary Club wasn't there, but I mean a club like that today. It's a free association, like the Boy Scouts or something. It's something you just join up to. In the Roman time period, they had many of those free associations. They had clubs that got together. They're almost always local. That is in the same city. So you might go to the local club of what I'll talk about in a second, say in Kiwani. It was a city-based. They almost always met people's homes, which means the maximum may up about 50 people. You might met at the temple grounds. You might met in a town hall, but usually met in one place. You can squeeze into it. There's almost always included a meal, whether it be annual or just holidays uh, or monthly, but a meal was associated to some degree. Uh, and of course, they experienced all kinds of things. They, equality, because in the real world, in the Roman century, no one, you are not equal. You are not equal. You have very clear striations of society, very clear. And so, but in this club, we're all basically the same. You might have officers, but we're all in this together. They had, they use these words, fellowship, family, community, and Latin communitas. They experience these things. Uh, not found in society, because in society you're not. It's master relationship to boss, you know, on and on relationship. So in these peer groups, they found these things. They, why do they get together? They might honor a particular God. It's the club dedicated to Zeus. It's the club dedicated to being a carpenter or a, a fireman. They have volunteer fire groups at the time. Uh, you might be in medicine. You might be a philosopher. You might be a musician. You might be whatever. And so it's a club for like a school. You go to the school and you have different clubs. They do that together as adults. They almost always prayed to the gods. They had libations, which means you poured out uh, wine on the ground for them to honor the gods in any club you met. And then you had, of course, conversations. And for the Latin word, uh, homilia, it means conversation. It's the word homily or homiletics, if you've ever heard the term. That's sometimes the translation for the word sermon. It just means a conversation, a homily. And oftentimes in Roman Catholicism, they still call it a homily because they spoke Latin for a trillion years, and so they still use the word, the, the, if there is such a thing, Catholics don't really have much of a sermon, but they'll call it a conversation. They had speeches, poetry, games, singing, dancing, and tons of wine. They drank, 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 drank. Drank, drank. It was a, big, it was a party. And, of course, they had leaders and officers. Now, if you don't know anything at all, here's a, a good rendition of what they did as they're reclining. It's called a triclinium. Typically, you lean down. You could have a chair. Romans went back and forth. Sometimes they had a table with chairs. Other times they leaned on the right arm, and they ate with the left, or vice versa. Um, and there you go. Children are playing. So these were all over the Roman Empire. Well, when the church was born 
in Jerusalem, and then later on, they were Jews, but they spread very quickly to Jews amongst all the Greco-Roman world. So the Romans, when they talked about what Christians were doing, they, they, they described what Christians were doing like they described free association. These are the exact same Greek and Latin words. And then Christians describe themselves as the same thing. So the non-Christians explained them that way, and the Christians took it on themselves. So I'd say it fits together. That is, early Christians took themselves to be in a free association. Now, they did something really weird. They called themselves an ecclesia. They called themselves the way. They called themselves different ish, the brothers and sisters. Um, Non-Christians called them Christianoi, uh, which is from a Greek word and a Latin word. Uh, it means someone's associated with Christ. Uh, but they tend to call themselves ecclesia. Now, that, that word just means a formal assembly. It could also mean a, a political representation. So if the president came into Kiwani and you got the mayor and all the people all together, they would go out and meet the president. Maybe that formal group, they might call it an ecclesia. Well, that was odd that Christians did that for the, for the, in the non-Christian world, but it wasn't odd for one reason. That is, Jews call themselves that. When the Jews, whatever, when they would speak uh, their Greek, they would call their synagogue sometimes an ecclesia, a formal assembly. So the word might be a little different from what non-Christians use, the word, but the functions were almost identical. So if you were to go to the temple of Zeus and join the club of Zeus or club of firefighters, and then you go to a Christian church, they would have felt very similar what they did, socially speaking. They met on Sunday evenings, not Sunday mornings, for a couple centuries. They met on Sunday nights because the first day of work in the Roman Empire was Sunday. So the first work day, now in the, in, the, in the ancient world, they didn't have weekends like we do. Weekends became an invention because of Judaism on Shabbat, Sabbath, from Friday night to Saturday night. So the Jews were allowed to take off, and eventually Sunday becomes such a sacred day uh, that it became a two-day off event, and that became the weekend. But they call that the Kuriaki, the Lord's Day, like in Revelation. To this day, if you're Greek Orthodox, you call Sunday Kuriaki, the Lord's Day. If you speak Russian, the Russian word for Sunday isn't Sunday, it's resurrection. And Russian, which I'd, I'd be cool to call it resurrection. I'll, I'm at Walmart. What are you doing on resurrection? And that'd be so cool. I love that. I can say, what are you doing on the Lord's Day? So Kodiaki, again, they still call that in Greek. But they would go to work. They'd come off, get off of work, and get together that night. And the Christian church, the, and, the, and we read this from all the New Testament. I, I had, there's a bunch of Bible verses, but I'm just saving time because this part. It was in two parts. The first part was always a communal meal. They call it the breaking of the bread. It's a, a communal meal, which they were excited. They said, get off of work, those who did work. The rich people didn't work. And that was one of the problems of the Corinthian church is the rich people were eating the food and drinking the wine during the day. So when the workers got off work, there's nothing left over. And it was causing a lot of arguments. So they were to eat the communal meal. And the second part was just like the pagan associations. They would have accept, and they would pray to God. The other people, you know, pray. Pray, they would sing, they'd preach, they'd teach, they'd have prophecies, they'd have tongues. It'd be, oh, I got this. By the second century, there's a document called the Didache that we see the start, church started doing other things as well. They started doing other church business, like uh, they would have elect bishops and deacons. They would reprimand one another or keep it, and you shouldn't be sinning, and so forth. They might, uh, they have all, all the various kinds of teaching from different teachers come in. They listen to visiting prophets. Uh, they would settle disputes. And so as the church grew and grew, they added more things to the church service. But here's an example, if you've ever read this story before, here's an example of evidence that the church met at nighttime when people got off work and they were tired and hungry. The Apostle Paul. In the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul is preaching. And my, there we go. On the first day of the week, that's Sunday, uh, when we met to break bread, Paul began to speak to the people. And because he intended to leave the next day, he extended his message until midnight, which means it's nighttime. And he's, sleep, he's preaching for a long time. I never have preached at midnight. You're welcome. See, I mean, never. Y'all get upset. Come on now. Now, there, and, and Luke says in Acts, he says, now there were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. It's Luke's way of saying, it's, we had a lot of, we, could, we were okay. It wasn't dark. We could see everything. Now, a young man named Eutychus who was sitting in the window, was sinking into a deep sleep like some of you do, while Paul continued to speak for a long time. Fast asleep, he fell down from the third story and was picked up dead. And this is more evidence that the church met in homes. This was actually been an apartment. Uh, and they had apartments in different towns and the cities were condensed. So this house church met on the third floor of an apartment. And he fell down, 
he acted like he was dead. But Paul went down, he threw himself on the young man, put his arms around him and said, don't die because I'll never be asked back to preach. He says, don't be distressed, he's still alive. Then Paul went back upstairs and it literally says, and after he had broken bread, he means the boy, after the boy broke bread, he ate, he talked to them a long time until dawn, that is, they showed he was okay. He left, they took the boy home alive and were greatly con- con- comforted. That is, whew, he didn't die. I've never killed anybody from my preaching. Not yet, there's time. They had no lawsuits. Can you imagine today someone fell out of an apartment? Who's to blame for that? Uh, so they preached all through the night. Okay, what I want to do very briefly is look at some examples in the text this morning of what their early church did. Now, if you look at the early church in, in the book uh, in, in the New Testament, it's not the case that Christians have to copy everything they did to be Christian. We don't have to go move to Jerusalem to meet in Jerusalem and so forth. But what we find in the New Testament and the early churches, there were certain things the church did that seems to have been duplicated by almost all the churches, regardless of the language they spoke and regardless where they lived. So turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Very quickly. And Acts 2, we'll start in verse 42, right? Yeah, verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Do you have it? Say amen. Please look at your Bible. Look at the Bible app. There's Bibles on the lamps. There's Bibles, phones, whatever. This is right after the uh, the apostle Peter and the disciples. They see this long sermon in Jerusalem, and people are like, oh, my goodness, at the end of the sermon, what do we got to do? Which is the best news ever after a sermon. How should I respond right now? And he says, great, believe in the Lord Jesus and get baptized, all of you. That is, that's what you do in response to the gospel. Do something about it. And they do. They do. Uh, and look in verse, we'll start in verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were out of that day about 3,000 souls. This is in, near the Temple Mound. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, those four things are kind of pillars in the early church. The teaching, that means apostles' teaching. The apostles, listen, listen, the apostles taught what Jesus taught. The Gospels, basically, are what Jesus taught. So while the apostles can't show up today and start preaching to us, they can through the Gospels. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, what Jesus taught, and to fellowship, which of course means checking on each other, moral accountability, encouraging one another, all those things that come along with that, to the breaking of bread, and that almost certainly means a sense of communion, reliving the Last Supper over and over, and of course to the prayers. They pray. They pray, of course, to God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 43. And fear came upon every soul. I love, oh man, that's one of my favorite. Fear, like, oh, have you ever had the sense of, uh, as C.S. Lewis talks about, the, the luminous, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the sense of, is that luminous not the word I'm looking for? I'll think of it in a second. The sense of all, the sense of eeriness. Almost, sometimes if you're in a room by yourself and you think you just, someone is in the room with you all of a sudden, the sense of, uh-oh, that eerie, that maybe the hair back your neck stands up. That's the kind of a condition they're describing here. Fear fell on everybody like something's different is going on right now. This isn't man-made or woman-made. And many wonders and signs were done to the apostles. What we might call, quote, miracles, but that's what they mean. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and good and distributed them all as they had need. It's not that they were socialist. It's that there were no needy people in the church. So as there was need, they took care of the needs of the needy people. It's not that everyone had the exact amount of wealth. It's that no one went without. They all had access to the wealth. That's different. It's not that everyone had the same amount of wealth. Verse 46, and day by day, attending the temple together. So that's the fifth thing. They go to the temple. That Why? Because they're praying and they're preaching. And breaking bread in their homes, and their homes, not a church building, but that was it. They partook of food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added their number. Woo, they're so excited about this. Here's an example. They would convert any place they could to a church early on, the house churches. You're looking at the actual Peter, the Peter, the Apostle Peter's house. I've been there. Now, right above this house now is a structure. We can walk up in the structure and look down through the glass and see it. Now, it might be kind of hard to see on the, in the image, but this octagonal shape was added about the 3rd or 4th century. The actual house is down here lower where the pebbles are. And they, so they, they built a church on top of it. Now, today we'd go, don't touch it. That's my fine china. Don't touch it. 
In the ancient world, they never did any of that. They, oh, that sacred spot, destroy it, build a church. Woohoo! Like, oh, did you do that? So we have to dig through the archaeology to realize there was a whole house beneath that. And they found ruins that even through the house of the ruins of the ha- Peter's house, it was converted to a church. They found Christian graffiti and so forth on the walls. So this is it. You can go there. This is where Pete, uh, Jesus would have grown up mo- a lot of his life, to his buddy Pete. And they would turn these things and break bread together in the houses. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10, all the way on the right side of your Bible, Hebrews chapter 10. You'll see 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, and you'll see Hebrews. It's almost a revelation. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Do you have it? I have to go pretty quickly. We're going to run out of time. Hebrews 9, uh, 10, 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way which he opened for us through the curtain, that is through the flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's baptism. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is what? He is what? Faithful. Faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. He means judgment day. I mean, we're talking about the end of the first century. These Jewish Christians, some have already skipped in church. It's, it's, not an old, it's not a new problem, right? There's, it's some of you are already skipping. No, 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 no. Let's consider ways. Look, we have such confidence to go before the Lord Jesus. Let's do that together. Let's stir up one another. And it is a, a goading. It's the word used. They would hit, hit the horse to go. Stir. Let's do this to love and good works to what? To stop, to stop sinning. That's what he means by this. That is you stop, stop, stop. Let that old life go. It's time to encourage one another. Go quickly to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter. So go backwards in your Bible a little bit. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. This is an example of what they did in the early church here. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ, that means the gospel, dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. With thankfulness, of course, whatever you do, order to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And these different psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, uh, there's not a clear distinction in the Greek or an ancient context, exactly what he has in mind. But most scholars agree that what he probably has in mind is both psalms, literally from the psalms of the Old Testament, and also songs Christians they wrote for the, to sing at the church service, and third, extemporaneous songs. Oh, I got one. It goes like this, hallelujah, hallelujah, this thing, hallelujah, and you sing, they would sing on the spot uh, Christian songs to the Lord Jesus. They would sing these things. And of course, in Titus chapter one, so find Titus, so keep going. Now you're gonna go back forward a little bit. Titus chapter one. So one and two Timothy, and then Titus. Titus chapter one, verse nine. Titus one, nine. Here he's talking about the life of, of an elder or in greek the bishop episcopos whatever uh, but we're going to start in verse nine these qualifications he must hold firm to the sure word as taught that's the uh, gospel message christian message that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to confute those who contradict it now that's one example of these are short examples of many examples in the new testament of what they did in the early church. That's teaching sound doctrine. That it's more than that, we not see anything else. In the early church, we found, if we had these texts and many more, we'd find that together, my batter, go ahead, Tim, the next one, buddy. Uh, sorry. The, the, throughout the early church, we say that here are some basic things we found. I found a little house church on the right side, a little picture. Christians met chiefly to devote themselves to the teaching of Jesus, to give and receive moral accountability, that is to stop sinning, to take care of fellow Christian victims' material needs, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. There are no lazy Christians. We don't help people who can do it themselves. We help victims. And he says in Galatians 6.10, be good to all people, especially those of the household of faith. All of our financial needs should go first and foremost to Christians who need it, and then other people, especially within our churches. Uh, In the New Testament, they did that. Pray for each other, enjoy each other's company, to praise God in song, 
to celebrate communion and to baptize new believers. Now, I didn't show you all that. We're going to spend hours on all this. But these become basic pillars of churches wherever you went. So if you traveled from Ephesus to Galatia to Rome to Jerusalem or whatever, you know you'd be doing some of the exact same things. Like today in many churches, if you went from here to Dallas to Vancouver to wherever it is, it'd be very similar. That's when Christians met chiefly to do these things. Think about that for a second. That's why they met. That's why Christians got together. What Christians did not ever meet to do is this. They didn't ever to be entertained. The church service was not entertainment business. I think this is sinking very clearly. It's not bad, listen please, it's not bad that Christians can be entertained. No, of course they can be. Christian comedians, Christian movies, of course, of course. They didn't meet for that. Entertainment won't help you at all in your faith. It doesn't build you up. In the background is the image of everyone, the image of Polycarp. Polycarp was a martyr of the first century. His, his mentor was John the Apostle. That'd be pretty cool. And the legend is that Polycarp was in front of everyone. These are Christians begging him to recant his faith, and he won't do it. Beside him are Christians that have been burned alive on the stake. And the legend is that as Polycarp also gets burned alive, the fire won't consume him because God protected him from the fires. So eventually they had to go and just stab him. And the lions wouldn't eat him either, so they came out of the thing and they just watched him from a distance. Can you fathom centuries of Christians martyred for their faith? And the reason why they get to church is to make sure they're entertained. They didn't meet for that reason. They didn't meet to be told that it doesn't matter what you do as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. That's really good pagan virtue. That's what non-Christians say about ethics. It doesn't matter as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. Nowhere in the Bible. They weren't coddled. They weren't entitled. They weren't told to make sure whatever you want in life is going to be yours. That's all it is. Make sure. God wants to make sure that you're blessed. Then maybe this is not fair at all. But I can't. What would you do? What are the masses and millions of people who have bought into the idea that God wants you to be blessed and rich? What would they do in the face of such persecution? What would you do in the face of persecution? They didn't meet together to make sure, here's how we're going to affect social justice. Here's how we're going to join that march. Should Christianity affect social justice? Of course it should affect it. Of course. Of course it should. But that's not what they met. They didn't meet together to make sure that their chief reason why, their vision statement was to make sure black lives matter or to make sure people don't stop aborting babies. I think, I think black lives do matter. I think we shouldn't kill babies. Absolutely. That's not what the church met together. There's overflow of the Christian message. Absolutely. But that's not what they met. I, I just dare you to find it. Anywhere in the first 10 centuries of the church, find where the church got together to make sure they did these things. They didn't. They never, ever preached or taught things because it was the new fad. That's what we do now in churches. You go to all, if you don't know this, this is inside scoop. It's what pastors do. They go to all the new workshops, North Point, Andalus, Stanley's Church. They go to all the big things they can to make sure they get all the new books, sticky this, orange red, everything they can, and bring it back. Because why? Because that church did it, and they grew by leaps and bounds. They got eight campuses. I'll bring it here and make sure that's the first thing we do, regardless if it's completely against Jesus. It doesn't matter. What matters is it works because it grows, and numbers, numbers, numbers are all we care about. They never confuse the church with the politics. They never confuse the two. At no point in the history of the church do they ever fly Roman flags in the church service. They didn't. Well, they were wrong to do that. I don't think they were wrong at all. I don't even know what they were doing. It's okay at least one place in the world where we get together and say, I'm not talking about my allegiances to sports teams and politics and whatever. I'm talking about my allegiance to ones, the one who gets all the most of me, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. They did not confuse these things. They just didn't do it. Why do you meet? Why do you do it? Why do you come here? It's worth asking. It's worth reflecting on. Here's my encouragement as, as we wrap up. My encouragement is to look at this list one more time and compose, write down, write down maybe why you come, why you think you come, and then write down you think maybe the New Testament and figure out which one of these maybe you can work on better. Think about that for a second. 
you can write it down. I'm going to put this on Facebook, too. I'll put the image on there. But you can take a picture. You can write it down. Which one of these, you know what, come to think of it, David, when I think about that, I don't come at all to get moral accountability. I don't want that at all from people. I'm going to, oop, oop, I got a zero on that one. I get a zero out of ten. I need to work on, or I, I don't come here to pray a song at all. In fact, I'd rather just show up late for the sermon because I don't care about the songs. I don't wear, oh, oh, my goodness. Matter of fact, I don't care about the prayer. I wish you'd just hurry up. I mean, think about that. We all have, we all do that to some degree. Why are you here? I bet if you and I committed to the Lord Jesus, of course, in his strength and power and grace and mercy, to try to go back, as it were, to these basic pillars of the New Testament, figure out why they did what they did, I bet it would change everything. I'm not suggesting that none of us do these things. I'm not suggesting the church doesn't do these things. I'm suggesting that if we stay focused on these things, we will be focused in the right direction. And our faith would mature leaps and bounds all the time. I know I'm committed, and I've got ones I'm working on too, but I'm committed to these. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, help us this morning get real serious about why we do what we do. That this time together as a church would not be an empty ritual, not a voidless, worthless ritual, but a serious one, full of serious, um, important, joyful solemn rituals that together we would be shaped into your image help us lord jesus get rid of all the reasons we came in here with that are not biblical or self-serving and instead embrace the reasons why you want us to meet in the name of jesus christ of course i pray amen